Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. We hope you're encouraged by the message. For more in-depth content and answers to questions submitted during the sermon, check out our podcast called Postscript. You can find it on iTunes or on our website at faithbridge.org forward slash podcast. Real people, real life. I'm the real Duffy Robbins. And uh, (laughs) I'm real glad to be here this morning. Thank you so much for being here. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. If you're a visitor, uh, we are delighted to have you worship with us. Uh, Christmas time is a time of stories. One of my, uh, one of my all-time favorite stories is, uh, is William Goldman's um, The Princess Bride. The Princess Bride. Uh, how many of you either read the book or seen the movie The Princess Bride? Let's see a show. Okay, yeah. Yeah, almost everybody. We, my, I watched it over the holidays with my kids and my grandkids. Um, in fact, I recently read uh, the book um, by Carrie Elwes, who played uh, Wesley. Uh, also known as the Man in Black and the Princess Bride, and uh, and and his book was called um, "As You Wish: Inconceivable Tales from the Making of the Princess Bride." It's a pretty fun book because it, it sort of gives us um, the the backstory behind uh, what is definitely one of the uh, I would say top ten. Uh, Robin's family favorite movies to watch, and and uh, and Elvis remarks in the book that that for him. Um, one of the fascinating parts uh, of the film's legacy is that it has so many lines uh, that, that, that people love to quote in everyday conversation. For example, you ever heard anybody, um, you know, just, just quote that classic one-word line when um, uh, the evil Vizzini is, is kind of having his war of wits with the man in black and he keeps saying, inconceivable, inconceivable. I mean, there are all kinds of lines like that in the movie. For example, um, um, when the, the man in black uh, sort of uh, cautions Buttercup with these words, he says, life is pain, Highness. Life is pain. Anyone who says differently is selling something. Or, uh, or, uh, or Inigo Montoya, maybe you remember this, he's preparing to engage in this, in this epic uh, sword fight with the man in black. He says, you seem a decent fellow. I hate to kill you. And the man in black responds, you seem a decent fellow. I hate to die. <laughs> or uh, uh, Prince Humperdinck, when he's trying to sort of console the lovely buttercup, says, please consider me as an alternative to suicide. Uh, one of the great pickup lines. Uh, and then, uh, and then uh, the man in black, after he knocks uh, out the, the big giant Fezzik, uh, you know, with this huge rock, he says, I do not envy you the headache you will have when you awake, but for now... Rest well and dream of large women, <laughs> which uh, is also an ancient Methodist benediction. But, but, uh, but, and then, of course, probably uh, the, 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 uh, the, the classic uh, from Princess Bride. Remember this from Inigo Montoya? Hello, my name is Inigo Montoya. You killed my father. What? Prepare to die. Yeah. Yeah, and in my, and in my favorite from the entire movie, the classic line from uh, Taylor, the, the queen of music, and the faker's going to fake. Baby, I'm just going to shake, shake, shake it. No, I know that's not the way. I just, I just wanted to try to update the movie a little bit. But I mention this because um, all of us love stories, don't we? we? We all love good stories. And stories, often without our even being aware of it, have this profound effect on us. They the stories that we see, the stories that we hear uh, become a part of the backstory that, that shapes our everyday lives. I think I told you a while back that uh, when I was a little boy, I used to think of the ocean as a, a safe place, sort of this, this, this big uh, blue vast playground, right? That, that's, that's where my friends lived, right? Flipper and, and Shamu. And, uh, and, and, and then I saw the movie Jaws. And, uh, and, and, and it was so big and, and so vivid and so, you know, bloody. And, 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 and at the time, uh, we were actually living about a half a mile from Cranes Beach in Ipswich, Massachusetts. And the setting for the film was the coast of Massachusetts. And, and I couldn't help it. After I saw that movie, everything changed for me. I mean, I knew it wasn't even a true story, but it was a vivid story. I mean, literally, the next time we went to the beach, I'm with my wife. I said, honey... Let's send the kids in first. You know, I mean, just, it just, it, stories have, right, they have this impact on us. They shape us. They, they warn us. They inspire us. They, they inform us. They, they remind us of who we are and, and who we want to be. This week and next week here at Faith Bridge, uh, we're going to hear together a, a stunning story. 
an, 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 an epic narrative of, of wonder and drama and, and tragedy and hope. And, and what makes it, I think, an even more amazing story, an even more stunning story, that it's not just a great story. It's, it's your story. It's my story. It's our story. It's the story that we gather every week here at Faith Bridge to celebrate as the community. It's the story of the world. It's, it's the story of all stories. Now, of course, of course, um, we've been in the last few weeks sort of living in and around um, the Christmas story. And, and it's truly a story of wonder and, and mystery. But this week and next week here at Faith Bridge, we're going to hear the story behind that story, the story behind that story. We're going to explore what might be described as the grand story, the grand story, the story of the world. Now, as you might expect, um, it's a story that begins in the very first book of the Bible. So if you have a Bible, I want to invite you this morning to turn with me to the very beginning, Genesis chapter 1. If you don't have a Bible, raise your hand, and uh, we'll be happy to make sure that you get one. We want you to be able to follow along. Genesis chapter 1, and if you are new to Bible study and you don't know where Genesis 1 is, simply open the book and you'll be very near. Genesis chapter 1. Now, uh, let me just also uh, caution you that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a somewhat abbreviated reading of this uh, passage this morning so we can cover uh, a lot of ground. This will sort of be the cliff notes uh, version of, of Genesis 1, sort of like a, sort of like a, a, a drive-through uh, edition. But I think you'll be able to uh, follow along if you just, uh, you can just read the text from the screens. Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters and God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse. And it was so. And God called the expanse heaven and there was evening and there was morning the second day. And God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth and the waters that were gathered together, he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Verse 11, and God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed and fruit trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind on the earth. And it was so, verse 14. And God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night. And let there be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. Verse 18, and God saw that it was good. Verse 20, and God said, let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures. And let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the heavens. Verse 21, and God saw that it was good. And God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters and the seas and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning the fifth day. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. Verse 25, and God saw that it was good. Verse 26, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Verse 31, and God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. God saw everything that he'd made, and behold, it was very good. I think it's understood generally um, that, that good stories, our favorite stories, um, often uh, sort of have an arc uh, from beginning to end. And, and, and while you'll find different ways and different terms for, for describing that art, um, novelists essentially describe them in terms of four big chapters. Uh, the first chapter, the opening chapter, is called Stasis. Stasis. These are, the, these are kind of the, the, those opening chapters, that opening portion of the book where, where we're introduced to a situation 
uh, a setting for the story being told. Think, think uh, Cinderella uh, sweeping the ashes or, or Jack living in poverty with his, with his mom and his cow or think, uh, think of uh, Frodo and the Shire or, or Harry Potter uh, living under the stairway in the home of the, of the Dursleys. Then we move into the second part of the story which is uh, the, the initiation, the, the, the beginning, the introduction of a quest. Something triggers, something triggers a change. Uh, it, it might be a visitor, it could be, it, it could be a, a, a genie, it could be a, 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 an owl with a letter, right? A, a, a tragedy, a choice, an event, a, a lottery ticket. If it's a, if it's a Liam Neeson uh, movie, it's usually a family member getting kidnapped. If, if it's, uh, if it's uh, Sylvester Stallone, it, it's probably a large explosion. But, but essentially, it's that something, something changes. Think, uh, think of the Hunger Games. The Hunger Games, um, when, when Katniss's sister, Prim, um, is chosen to compete uh, in this uh, fight to the death competition that is the Hunger Games. And, and that trigger scene, that trigger scene when Katniss steps forward to take the place of her sister. And that moves us then into the middle, the body, the main part of the story, which of course we call the body of the story. It's marked by twists and turns and, and, and surprises and, and, and plot developments that ultimately bring us to a critical choice, a critical choice, a, 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 a tipping point that, that sort of brings the plot to a, to a point of climax. Think Romeo and Juliet, uh, that their, their suicide pact, right? That, that fateful choice of those of those final moments, or, uh, or or Cinderella and her uh, her her sisters, you know, when they're actually you know trying on the glass slipper, or or Sylvester Stallone and and uh, and, and 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 another explosion. Uh, it's 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 it, 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 and then finally we're, we're ushered into the final part of the story, the final part of the arc, when when we we go to the last chapter, which is a chapter of kind of a resolution or or a reversal. Um, this is that moment of consequence uh, when we, we actually see the result or the, the, the outcome of that climactic choice made by the main character or the, or the main characters in the story that leads us to a new situation, a, a new reality, a new setting or a whole new story uh, or, or in the case of Sylvester Stallone, uh, a, a sequel. But, but, but when we take the scripture as a whole, when we take the scripture as a whole, we actually see very much the same sort of arc. And we see this arc playing out in scripture in very, very vivid ways. And, and that arc, that story, is what we're going to be talking about this week and next week uh, here at Faith Bridge. Next week, we're going to look at, at chapters 2, 3, and 4 of that grand story. This week, we're going to focus primarily on, on chapter 1 because that's where the story begins. Now, um, in, in the grand story of the Bible, in the grand story of the Bible, the ark generally looks like this. We begin in chapter 1 with creation. Then chapter 2 is the fall. Chapter 3 is redemption. And then chapter 4, restoration. Now, um, I get it. I get it. If, uh, if some of you are thinking to yourself, well, um, you know, Duffy, I don't want to be rude or anything, but frankly, that doesn't sound as interesting uh, as a young woman falling in love with a vampire. And, and I get that, that, that if you just look at the story uh, on the face of it it, it, it doesn't seem like such an amazing drama. But remember, this is a, this is a cosmic drama. This is not uh, Never Never Land. This is a true story. This is a story that is the back story of every story you've ever heard. So let's, let's begin with this chapter one, the story of creation. Chapter one, the story of creation. Right away, right away, when, when we look at this passage of scripture that we read this morning in Genesis chapter one, we, we see very clearly that this story of the world is a story authored by God. That's fundamental. That's critical. It's a story authored by God. In fact, eight times in this passage from Genesis chapter one, the scripture says, God said, and it was. God said, and it was. Now think about that. God said, and 
it was. I mean, you think about your, your, your favorite authors, your favorite writers, you know, uh, J.K. Rowling, right? The, the, the whole Harry Potter books, amazing. Uh, probably the, the thickest books uh, most of us will ever read. Uh, or uh, or uh, Tom Clancy. Do we have any Clancy fans here in the room this morning? Yeah, yeah, all male. Uh, yeah, Tom Clancy. I mean, Hunt for Red October. He taught me everything I ever knew about submarines. Uh, or or uh, Suzanne Collins and I mean, uh, the whole Hunger Games saga. I mean, right, just... An amazing collection of, of, of stories. You can't help it. You read one of those books and you, you kind of want to take up archery, you know, or, 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 or buy some clothing that will just burst into flame. But these, these stories, as, as amazing as they are, as profound as they are, and there's so many, you know, great writers over the span of time, you know, the Shakespeare's, the Tolkien, C.S. Lewis, up into modern times, you know, people like Jan Karen or, 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 or all these great authors. But here's what's unique about Scripture. The Bible tells us a story that comes from the mind and the heart of God. The Bible tells us a story that comes from the mind and heart of God. The Bible is inspired by God. 2 Timothy 3.16 tells us all Scripture is God-breathed. All Scripture is God-breathed. At the heart of this story is a God who makes himself known. This is a story by God, about God and his creation. We notice, for example, as we peruse this first chapter of the grand story in verse 1, Genesis chapter 1, that, that God is already on the stage when uh, the curtain opens in this story. Right away, we read, in the beginning, God. In the beginning, God. There was a time when there was no sun. There was a time when there was no sea. There was a time when, when, when there were, you know, no mosquitoes or mountains or aardvarks or comets or oceans or milky ways. But there was no time, no time when God was not God is eternal. He is, he is beyond time. We learn, too, as we look at the text, this opening chapter of Genesis, that God is a God of order. God is a God of order. He's not just eternal. He is also in control. There's an intelligence, a, a design to God's work. For example, I wanted us to, to, to observe that, that God does work on different days, and, and he sets out different tasks for different days, that there's an order and a design to it. There's a, there's a sequence. It, it, would have, it was intentional. For, for example, uh, it would have been unfortunate if God had created fish before he created water. Uh, that, right? That'd be like pouring your coffee before you have a cup. That there's a design to it. There's a sequence to it. Uh, the, the, the closer we look, often, often even in the realm of science, the more we become aware of an order, of, a, of, of an amazing, magnificent order and intelligence in creation. This is what we mean um, when, when we occasionally use the word intelligent design, intelligent design. We also observe that God is a God of power. God is a God of power. He creates this story out of nothing. Uh, the writer of Genesis uh, describes in chapter 1 the stasis, the setting, by using terms like without form, uh, void, uh, darkness. Uh, sometimes the Hebrew term is translated into, into the word chaos, uh, and yet what's stunning is that out of this nothing, out of this void, God creates light, night, day, beauty, order. And he does it all. He does it all, not just because God is a God of power and because God is a God of order, but because God is also a God of goodness. He's a God of goodness over and over it's interesting, isn't it? You almost miss it. Over and over in Genesis chapter 1, we, we see this phrase, God saw that it was good. God saw that it was good. I, I'll be honest with you. I, I'm familiar with my work when I was in school. It might have said, Duffy saw that it was good enough. I, I mean, uh, you know, they, but, but, but there's something about God that, 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 that the, the end result of his hands, the, the, the product of his work, God saw that it was good. His intent is to make that which is good, to make that which is, in fact, we're actually told in chapter two, it's interesting. The reason God created woman was because he saw it was not good. 
that the man should be alone. He's not good that the man should be alone. I'm gonna just pause here for a minute so that you can reflect on the self-control I am demonstrating by not saying something here I might later regret. But, 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 but through this whole, through this whole account, what is very, very clear is that this is a God who is all about the good. A God who is all about the good. And yet what I think makes this story even more remarkable, even more stunning, is that this eternal, good, wise, and powerful God chooses to engage with the world he has created. He chooses to engage with the world he has created. He's not just some sort of, you know, supreme uh, Oz, you know, you know, sorry. He's not, he's not just some supreme mastermind who, who flips the switch and then steps back. God is a creator who says, let there be light, then flips the switch and then steps in, moves closer. God draws near right away chapter one verse two we see intimacy words like hover over hover over and and, and one of the images suggested by the by the wording here in the hebrew is the image of an eagle uh, hovering over her young uh, protecting caring providing nurture Uh, and then in chapter two verse seven when god creates man uh, he, he he the scripture says he formed him He formed him. Again, the Hebrew suggests uh, the image of a craftsman at work. Uh, 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 Imagine a potter carefully molding uh, the clay, not so worried about getting his own hands dirty that he refuses to work with his creation. And then in verse 7 of chapter 2, that amazing phrase, God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. God breathed into man's nostrils the breath. Now, that is a God who comes close, right? That, that's intimacy. So, just suppose, just suppose that today as you leave here, you know, and you exit that door, and I'm out there shaking hands, and as you approach me, I'd say, you know what? I think I'd like to just breathe into your nostrils. <laughs> You'd probably say, you know what? How about a handshake, you know? Or, or how about I go through the other door? But, but they're just a, they're just a, there's, a, there's a God here who is portrayed as intimately involved and engaged in the story he creates. So right off the bat, right off the bat, Genesis chapters one and two, in the opening chapter of this grand story, we read about a God. We read about a God who is in control, a God who is powerful, a God who is good, a God who chooses to come near. That's where the story begins. That's the stasis. That's, that's the given. That's the setting. Which raises this question. Why read any further? Why would we read any further? Why, why, should, why should a story like that matter to us on this Sunday morning, the Sunday after Christmas, the Sunday before brand new year, 2015? Why would we want to pursue any further such a story? It's a very, very important question. And we're going to think this morning about two very important answers to that question. The first answer is this. The first reason why this grand story matters to you and to me this morning, whether you're a, whether you're a, a, a senior adult who, who, is, uh, who, who is now kind of thinking about uh, family members who've left your home after holidays, or maybe you're alone again, or maybe you're maybe a middle school person, or maybe you're a mom or a dad, or, or maybe you're a single person, or maybe you're just kind of some here this week who's sort of checking stuff out because, because it's a, a new year and stuff. Why does this story matter to us? Reason number one is this. We need to hear this morning, men and women, there is a story behind your story. We need to understand there is a story behind our story. Um, I'm going to ask you to put a picture on the screen here. As you look at this picture, I want to ask you a question. Um, Does anybody know the name of this uh, piece of art? Anyone know the name of this piece of art? Anybody know? Yep. Bummer, neither do I. Uh, no, okay, let's just close in prayer. No, actually, uh, it, it's actually called uh, Sunday Afternoon en la Grande Jacques. 
Sunday afternoon on La Grande Jatte. Uh, what makes this a piece of art somewhat intriguing is that it was actually done by an artist named Georges Seurat. He was 25 years old at the time, and he was experimenting with a very, very new and innovative technique in painting. Uh, it's now going to be called pointeism. Pointeism. Seurat's theory was that it, rather than using brush strokes on a work of art, the colors would be more vivid if someone were simply to dot the canvas with the brush, to simply make dots on the screen. He, he thought that having more uh, surface to the drop of paint would actually expose the surface of the paint to more light and therefore reflect more uh, color, bigger colors. Uh, it actually took him two years to do uh, the image that you saw there. It's actually a massive uh, canvas. But what I think is so striking about the painting is this. When you look at it up close, when you look at it up very, very close, as you saw there, it just looks like this kind of odd, disconnected collection of dots on a canvas. But when you step back, when you step back and you view it from the right perspective, all of a sudden you begin to sort of see unfolding right before your eyes this amazing story, a story of color and, 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 and beauty and, and mystery. And that I think is what God wants us to see in this opening chapter of Genesis this morning. Because there are some of us here this morning, men and women, at the end of 2014, on the threshold of 2015, who are looking at a life that sometimes feels like just random dots, random dots on a canvas, just a, just a, a, a random collection of conversations, uh, encounters, days at school, days at work, homework, housework, family relationships, tweets, pins, Facebook posts. These words that we've read this morning from Genesis chapter one, this grand story being told in God's word reminds us that we are not just dots on the canvas. Our lives are not just disconnected brush strokes of, of fate and, and luck. That There is a bigger story. There is a grand design and a great, caring, loving, powerful designer, and that we are, everyone inside this room, everyone outside this room, we are all part of this creation story. And if we could begin, if we could begin to see in our lives the, the, the dots and, and the brushstrokes of his care and, and, and love, it, it, would, it would begin to change the way we see the big picture. And when we have the right perspective on the big picture, it helps us see more clearly and better and make sense of all the everyday little pictures that we're going to see as we stare into the year ahead. Whether those pictures be, be happy or sad or painful, or confusing, or awkward, or scary, or exhilarating. Israel, Israel was living in exile, discouraged and disheartened, living under the hand of, of the Babylonians, wondering, uh, no doubt, what had happened to all the great promises God had given them, wondering how a, how a good story could have gone so bad, wondering perhaps if it was all just some kind of fairy tale, some sort of never, never land. And through the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 29, verse 11, God reminded them, hey, don't lose sight of the bigger picture. Don't forget there is a bigger story. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11, God says, for I know the plans I have for you. Plans for welfare and not for evil to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek with all your heart. See how that, you see how that, that, that grand story with this opening chapter of, of God's good and, and loving and thoughtful creation can make a huge difference in the way you and I think about our story as we walk into this new year ahead. How, how, how might it change the way we, we look at the random moments uh, of, of, of difficulty or achievement or, or, or struggle or confusion or breakups and breakdowns? There is a story. There is a story 
behind your story this morning. Which points us to the second reason. The second reason why it's so important for us to this morning hear this grand story. Um, And that's this, that the story you believe, the story that you believe ultimately is the story you live. Trust me. The story you believe, that's the story that you live. Let's do a little experiment this morning. Um, Is anybody here good with, uh, anybody good with riddles? Anybody good with riddles? Okay. Uh, not so hot at riddles, not so great at art. Uh, let's, uh, that's okay. Let, let's, uh, let's just try it. We'll put a riddle here on the screen. Uh, you can read along. You enter a room. Romeo and Juliet lie dead on the floor. Broken glass and water surround them. A cat peeks out from behind the curtain. How did they die? That's, that's, that's the riddle. You enter a room. Romeo and Juliet lie dead on the floor. Broken glass and water surround them. A cat peeks out from behind the curtain. How did they they die. Who thinks? If you've never heard this riddle, if you've heard it before, just, just sit there and, and be smug. Uh, but if you've never heard the riddle before and you just figured it out, put your hand in the air. We're going to give you a pledge card. Uh, if you, okay, no hands. Um, <clears throat> yeah, well, well uh, the, the answer to the riddle is, is what? Anybody know? Yeah, yeah. Romeo and Juliet are actually goldfish. Goldfish. Yeah, and, and they died because the cat swatted the bowl and knocked the bowl off the shelf. And it, uh, yeah. And part of what makes a riddle a riddle is that it is a tiny little story. And we tend to hear these tiny little stories in the context of larger stories, right? So, so when we hear this morning this tiny story about Romeo and Juliet, we hear that story in the context of a, of a familiar Shakespearean drama, right? But there's a problem because, because we're going broken glass and, and, and water and cats. I don't remember that. Uh, you know, what about the lover's vows and the poison and the, and the tragic uh, moonlit night? It, it just doesn't make any sense. It's confusing because we're working with the wrong story. We're working with the wrong story. This riddle is not a story about about two Shakespearean figures. It's a story about two goldfish who who meet a tragic death at the claws of a cat. Story matters. Story matters. That's why it's so absolutely important that we believe and embrace and live into the right story. Every one of us here this morning is living out a story we believe and that, and that story impacts how you see and how you hear and how you think about every other little story in your life. And, and maybe you're aware of it and, and maybe you're not. I mean, if we had asked those goldfish, you know, do, do you feel safe up there uh, in the water? They'd go, what's water? They, they, don't, they're not even, they don't even know there's such a thing. as they, This is what they live and they breathe and they swim in. They, they're not even conscious that there's something called water. Water. All of us in this room live and breathe and swim every day in stories that impact our story. What is that story for you? Is it, is it, is it a story of resentment? Is it a story of, of, of entitlement or, or, or guilt or regret or hope or determination or, or maybe even victimhood? A, a story of joy or sacrifice. Maybe it's a story of the American dream. The American dream, pull yourself up by your own bootstraps, be the main hero in your own story. Life is about who outwits, outlasts, and outplays. Ooh, right? It, it, it's, it's, it, it's, it's sort of, or, or maybe your story is the Hollywood romance. Uh, you know, find the right person, beautiful, buff, who will sweep you off your feet and make your life wonderful. Or maybe it's the Madison Avenue story, you know? Get the next technology, buy the right eye gadget, own the perfect coffee maker, you know, just the right car, uh, drive it into just the right three-car garage in just the right house in just the right neighborhood. There are a million other puny stories that, 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 that turn on some climax of, of recognition or wealth or health or good grades or, or, or winning records or success or, or 
acquisition. But it all basically comes down to this story. I did it my way. I did it my way. What I hope we can begin to recognize this morning, men and women, is the grand story of God offers us a chance to live into a bigger story, a bigger story, a better story, a truer story. Because your story, the story you believe, that's the story that you live. You know, it's ironic because one of those kind of key trigger lines in the movie The Princess Bride is when Wesley says to Buttercup, the beautiful princess, as you wish, your highness, as you wish. And, and in so many ways, that's the kind of fairy story we, we sort of grow up dreaming about, isn't it, right? We, we want to get our wishes. We want to get our way. It's, it's a story that promises us happiness ever after as you wish. But unfortunately, spoiler alert, what we're going to see next week as we move into chapter two of this grand story, that story has already been told and it did not lead. It still does not lead to the happily ever after that we are promised. Because in God's grand story, the focus is not on us. The focus is on God. And the life you were made for comes not through highness, but through lowness. Because in God's grand story, the key trigger line is a sincere and humble prayer that ushers in each new day and and every chapter of, of the story and the brand new year with these words. As you will, my king, as you will. Well, I don't know this morning. I don't know this morning what is your story. Whether it feels like an adventure or a a tragedy or a a satire or a mystery or a fairy tale or or, or maybe it just feels like Sylvester Stallone showed up and started blowing things up. But here's what I do know. Here's what I do know. 2,000 years ago, there was a man named Paul, uh, a studied man from Tarsus, an educated man, a cultured man, a man who used to think of his story in terms of tribal prestige and family bloodlines and judicial power, religious goodness and and elite education until the inconceivable happened. One day on the road to Damascus, this guy Paul had an encounter with Jesus And that encounter chapter changed every other chapter in his story, so much so that in the most difficult days of his life, when his story took a hard turn, when he spent his days in in, in danger, living under constant threat of of imprisonment and death, burdened by concerns for the people that he, he loved, facing opposition and accusation and discouragement, he never thought of his story in terms of tragedy or self pity. Or failure. His story always seemed to have about it a sense of hope, adventure, gratitude, and promise because his story, his story was rooted in a grand story that had as its opening chapter a creation story about a good, caring, powerful, and wise God. Paul puts it this way in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day for this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. Men and women, those are the words of a guy who has been captured by a bigger story, a bigger story. 
What if you and I this morning, what if we in this coming year could trust a powerful, loving, caring, wise God with our story? with our families, with our relationships, our work, our future, even, the, even the, the dirty, messy stuff that we're too ashamed to put fully into his hands. What would it be like for you to face your new year embraced by that grand God and that great story? It's not inconceivable. It's not. It all boils down to one of two trigger lines. As you wish or as he wills. Let's pray. This changes everything, Lord. We think about the fact that this morning we are playing a part in a cosmic drama. Decisions count. Pain truly hurts. It's not, just a, it's not just a facade, but promise is also real. Hope is authentic. Lord, I pray today for someone whose story seems so dark without shape or form. Would you help us today to recognize that right at the heart of it is a good, loving, kind, caring, powerful God who wants to be right at the center of our story so that we might know his goodness, his grace, so that we might say with him, this is good. We pray this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.